Since we're now asking visitors to social distance as they travel and wait in longer queues, I'd like to use this video to talk about how destinations can get tourists to act appropriately, or as it's also known, compliance, or as it's also known, stopping tourists from behaving badly. And this is something that has been going on for some time. There's over a billion and a half of us international travelers out there, even more domestic travelers. Let's face it, we're not exactly known for amazing etiquette. Like these morons who think it's okay to stand or sit on coral. Or these Chinese tourists attacking a buffet like starving piranha in a restaurant in Thailand. Or this idiot taking a swim in Rome's Trevi Fountain. Or these dipsticks. A half dozen Czech tourists were detained in early November for running around the Kazakh capital. And with all those COVID-19 regulations, that's just more rules for travelers to break. When it comes to reining this in, you might think of road safety for a moment. We use driver's education, we put up signs to remind them, and we have fines to discourage bad behavior. It's not surprising that we're using some of these same techniques with tourists. But which is most effective? Or, as I'm going to explain in a minute, maybe we should be trying something entirely different. Destinations started their journey towards tourist compliance by putting up not-so-subtle clues of what they wanted them to do. No peeing, no tank tops, no photography, no parking, no loitering, no smoking, no sitting, no picnicking. Wear this, but don't wear that, and don't wear any of this stuff. And then came the fines. In Florence, the mayor added a 500 euro fine for public snacking. Basically, no doing this. Snacking while sitting on the curb is especially bad, but these officers don't seem to be in the mood to make any bus. Breaking COVID lockdown rules also comes with a fine in Canada. They even set up special hotlines so people could turn on each other and rat out their neighbors. Those fines were roughly $1,000. And it's proven a nice source of income for the cities. Amsterdam came up with a fine campaign to keep tourists from public urination and littering. The Croatian island of Kfar has had enough of rowdy tourists turning the classy destination into what's been described as a boozed up free for all. The island's new mayor has just introduced a raft of fines to encourage visitors to behave and dress more appropriately. Not wearing a top could cost 500 euros. Wandering around in a swimsuit, 600. Drinking in public, 700 euros. A Russian tourist has been fined 20,000 euros and has been handed a four-year suspended sentence for carving a giant letter K into the walls of one of Italy's most prized ancient Roman landmarks. But none of those is apparently as bad as flying a drone in Canada's Banff National Park. That comes with a $25,000 fine. Palau took a different approach, trying to use education. What if we made the tourists police themselves? Introducing the Palau Pledge, a first-of-its-kind immigration policy for good. All visitors now need to sign an environmental pledge to gain admittance into Palau. Stamped into the passport of international arrivals, the pledge is a formal promise to Palau's children. This was followed by Aruba. and Yellowstone. But even when it comes to these things, I think the way they are asking for compliance is very different. I mean, there's a big difference between reading the pledge online to yourself, like Yellowstone asked us to do, and typing your name and ticking a box online, as we do with every software download without reading it, like Aruba asked us to do, and actually signing your name, like Palau demanded. Going a step further would be standing in front of someone and promising out loud that you'll do something. I couldn't find any studies on this, but it feels like the way they get us to pledge is definitely going to affect our compliance. But if we could just make the tourists understand, then they'll do the right thing, right? 
But we can't really rely on the bulk of tourists to educate themselves about a culture. In the BWCA, they require it. BWCA is Boundary Waters Canoe Area, this pristine bit of protected wilderness between the US and Canada. Before you can enter, you need a permit. And before you can get a permit, they ask you to watch two videos at home and then make you watch the third one there at the ranger station when you pick up your permit. Here's a little sample from that third video. Make sure you have a bear resisting container or bear ropes to store your food. And the Boundary Waters is home to some of the cleanest water in the world. Let's keep it that way by doing dishes at least 200 feet away from shorelines and streams. Never wash dishes or yourself in the lake, not even with biodegradable soap. Helpful stuff, right? And people are happy to do it. The trick is really just getting them to watch. Instead of watching the nine millionth high budget film telling me to put on my seatbelt, I mean, it's 2020, I think we know how the basics of sitting on an airplane seat for a few hours. Wouldn't it be better to use some of that in-flight time with a captive audience and turn passengers into better visitors? That's when people are actively interested in how not to insult the people they're about to encounter. And they certainly want to know how to not get fined or land in jail. Destinations, airline media, pick up the phone and call each other. It seems like a great fit. But let's move beyond the education, the signs, and the fines for a moment and start with something you've probably heard of, nudging. Right, so, so I guess the challenge always is people have this idea that they want individual freedom and we don't want to trade off. Right? But, but I think that you have to find ways of nudging the behavior slowly and in different ways. Holidays are moments of pleasure. You know, um, most people are willing to be told what to do at home. But when we go on a holiday, we say, you know what, I've, I've been a good guy for 51 weeks in the year. Sorted this week, I'm going to have a good time. In Stockholm, just a few kilometers from where I am right now, Volkswagen sponsored some interesting experiments along those lines. Like this one. By turning the stairs into a piano, they made it more fun and nudged people into getting a little more exercise. And it worked. Or by adding some sound effects to this trash can. They made it sound fun to throw away litter. And this nudging got people to clean up because it was fun. And my favorite, they combined the fine aspect with nudging and came up with this beauty. The speed of camera lottery would do two things. One, it would photograph uh, speeders, give them a uh, citation, uh, and that money goes in a pot. But if you're obeying the law, your picture will also get snapped. You'll be entered into a lottery and win some of that money from those speeders. And then there's another way of doing things designed compliance. Let's go back to my original car analogy. Here in Sweden, they came up with something called zero vision, an aspirational goal to reduce traffic fatalities to zero. But how they want to achieve it is interesting and has broader implications. The movement really started back in the late 1950s when they said, it doesn't matter how much we educate or find drivers, or even if we put up a million signs, there's still gonna be crashes. So let's just make the cars safer. And that led to Volvo's seatbelt in the rear-facing child seat. And now they're saying, let's make the road safer. Instead of putting up a sign and asking drivers to slow down, let's force compliance with something like a speed bump. So how does this apply to tourism? The Dutch came up with this special paint that splatters people's pee right back at them. It's the public urination equivalent of a speed bump. In Paris, they tried these public urinals, which turns people's pee into fertilizer right in front of their eyes. Nice idea, could have been designed to be a little more discreet. 
The city of Florence didn't want people to sit on the steps in front of this basilica. So instead of hiring a full-time staff to ask them to leave, as Rome has done with the Spanish steps, Florence decided to clean the steps by spraying water on them in the middle of the day, figuring people wouldn't sit when it's wet. Clever idea. Because the summer sun dried them up pretty quickly, they had to do it more than once. Or we can force good behavior with technology. For example, we could get rid of virtually all drunk driving tomorrow if politicians made this mandatory in every car. The alcohol detection system will measure the alcohol in a driver's blood in less than a second. If it is above the legal limit, the vehicle won't move. For drivers under 21, for whom any amount of blood alcohol is illegal, the system can be programmed for a zero tolerance policy. To get an accurate, reliable reading, two technologies are being explored, a breath-based system and a touch-based system. The breath-based technology pulls the driver's exhaled breath into a sensor, which could be located in the driver's side door or in the steering column as the driver breathes normally. Or what if a destination wanted to combine things? Let's say a destination wanted to stop tourists from using the sort of sunscreen that damages their coral reefs because it's killing their reefs. One, travelers could get an email in advance of their trip explaining that regular sunscreen is not allowed and why. Two, they get a reminder about that just before the trip. Three, there's an in-flight video that explains how sunscreen damages the reef, reminds them that they've been told in advance and that if they're bringing in any, it's gonna get confiscated at the airport. But if they do have some taken away, they will get a voucher to buy some eco lotion right at the destination. Four, at hotel check-in, they'll sign a pledge. Or even better, make a verbal pledge in front of the front desk staff that lists a few things the destination wants them to observe, including the suntan lotion law. Five, the new eco lotion they buy is touted for having improved effects for the skin and protection, and maybe even each eco lotion purchase is connected to a special lottery where travelers can win free tours or meals or hotel nights. Six, signs about the coral reef protection are aimed at kids, asking them to help save Nemo. And seven, upon departure, they get information telling them how much they protected the destination and thanking them for their contribution. In other words, if destinations want to get tourists to act responsibly, they do have a number of tools at their disposal. It's just a question of using the right ones and in a coordinated way. Telling people across the world that uh, polar bears are dying because of climate change, because we've got less ice. The result has been an increase in 300% of people flying to see polar bears. <laughs> okay.